Hey everyone, thanks for attending today's roundtable conversation put on by the Digital Signage Federation. Today our topic is we're going to talk about using touch screens for donor walls, honor walls, and a lot of other recognition type displays. Uh, my name is Ryan Cohoy with Rise Vision, and I'll be moderating today's panel. Um, today you know, we're really going to focus in on different uses of digital signage for recognizing. And you know, just to set the context for the conversation, I wanted to flash up a couple of photos of examples. You know, one of the key areas that we're seeing uh, applications of touch screens is athletic hall of fames. You know, people have just outgrown. There's there's not enough wall space for putting up uh, etched glass and trophies and things today. So migrating to touch technology to help tell those stories and recognize athletes. Another area is you know, a wide range of the colleges on universities were made possible by generous donations from benefactors. So putting up touchscreen displays to, again, tell the stories, show the generous gifts, recognize uh, annual donors, different groups, different categories. Uh, digital signage has become a, a really popular option for for doing that. And then uh, healthcare has also become uh, a real key user of digital donor recognition displays. And, and this is an example of not only a video wall, but tying both digital and traditional signage together to where you know you can still use the etched glass and the nice surroundings to really dress it up. So they're they're not competing products, they're very complementary when you look at digital and, and static technology. So um, what we really want to encourage a, a lively roundtable conversation uh, discussion today. Uh, all the lines are muted, but we do encourage questions. So in the lower right hand corner of your video window, you should see a green box that says ask a new question. Uh, please put your questions in there. If you see common questions or things that are of interest to you, feel free to vote those up. If you do have any challenges or you don't see that green box, if you put your mouse over the screen up to the top, you should see nine little dots. If you click on that, uh, it should open a QA window that will show up on your right hand side that will give you that green ask a question. Um, but also if, if you aren't seeing this, uh, go back to that original Google events page that you started watching the video from and there's a box there that says say anything or say something. Feel free to put that in. We'll moderate from that page as well. So definitely uh, however it's best for you to get us the questions, we want to make sure and get those. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn the keys over to Brian Gorig from the Digital Signage Federation and give him an opportunity to just introduce some of the great things the DSF's doing and, and talk a little bit about some of the resources available. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Really appreciate uh, you uh, introducing this topic today. My name is Brian Gorg. I am the Executive Director for the Digital Signage Federation. I wanted to update everybody about some of the things the Digital Signage Federation uh, is doing, particularly in the areas uh, of education and this platform the Google Hangouts is really our flagship program and it's becoming very popular thank you for joining us today we encourage you to keep up with our schedule and invite colleagues and friends this is open to the public it's not just for DSF members and it's part of our outreach to the greater community uh, in our industry verticals to uh, promote the best use of digital signage um, we will be launching our upcoming uh, Google Hangout or education series through July. An announcement about that is actually coming out today uh, about a number of the topics we are going to be looking at every other week. Those topics include looking at 4K video, uh, the use of near field communication and beacons in terms of audience measurement and to um, engage audiences in different settings the use of press to um, generate more interest in your digital signage project. So this isn't necessarily for an end user, but it's also for the, the vendor community as well. Uh, we're also looking at the, the effects that HTML5 is having on digital signage and how uh, organizations and users are leveraging that technology in the future. We encourage you to always take a look at our industry calendar. We have a lot up there. Uh, one of the things we're doing that's uh, germane to a lot of this audience is we are doing outreach to the university community uh, through an organization called UB Tech. 
At the end of this program today, I'll let you know how to get a discount code to that program, which is in ju this June in Orlando. It's a university uh, higher ed uh, techn uh, technology and business um, executives. We reach out to them to talk about the use of digital signage on campuses. Obviously, donor walls is are one use of digital signage that's very effective and, and very commonplace now on, on campuses. And so um, we encourage you to consider uh, coming to that event as well. Uh, also, if you're an end user, and uh, meaning you're from a hospital, a museum, a university, somebody who's interested in putting up donor walls, we encourage you to get in touch with us. Uh, my contact information will be coming up here shortly. But please contact us about how to engage in an end user only um, networking circle. These are monthly calls that people within certain industry verticals, let's say transportation or healthcare or universities, get together on the phone to talk about uh, different issues related to their digital signage networks. So, uh, Ryan, if we go to the next slide. Yep. Okay. Um, so please go to our event calendar and um, uh, let us know how we can help you. Um, and again, at the end of this, uh, as we conclude this hangout, I'll let you know about getting the um, the discount code to UB Tech and how to uh, access the recorded videos that we have from these uh, every two week Google Hangouts. Great. Well, thanks, Brian. Um, again, as you mentioned, got it up on the screen. You know, check out the DSF website. A lot of great resources that are out there. Uh, you know, check those out, the events, etc. So, with that, I'm going to talk real briefly about uh, the panel that we put together here today. Uh, joining me is Spencer Graham from West Virginia University. Spence is my uh, cohort in crime here at the DSF. We co-chair the education subcommittee. So, um, you know. Spence has a wealth of knowledge in terms of managing a, a very large network of digital displays across WVU's campus, but he's uh, ventured into putting up these donor and honor walls recently, so he's going to share his experience from hardware, software, content, and you name it from an end user perspective. Um, also joining us is Kim Jones from CastNet. CastNet's a digital signage solution provider that specializes not only in providing the, the hardware and the solutions, but uh, you know, really helping people navigate the software and the content to make that experience. So they're going to share some of their experiences with building out some some very fantastic interactive uh, recognition type projects. Um, as mentioned, my name is Ryan Cahoy from Rise Vision, and I'll be acting as the moderator. Uh, I did put my email address up on the screen. Uh, as with anything, we're constantly trying to feed this beast. Uh, as Brian mentioned, we've got uh, hangouts planned uh, through now and the end of July. Um, but we're always looking for more ideas, and we're specifically looking for panelists, people that want to share their stories, their ideas. So jot down my email address, reach out to me uh, or Spence. Let us know if you've got an idea, if you want to participate. Uh, you know, help us get more of this information and more of these conversations going within the industry. Um, also going to flash up uh, Brian's email address as well as Jerry from the DSF. Uh, if you'd be more comfortable talking to them about ideas for these Hangouts or some of the things Brian mentioned in terms of uh, end user uh, groups, um, or just getting involved in the DSF. We are a volunteer organization, and we're you know always looking for eager people to help us do programs such as this. Um, and again, really can't encourage this enough. We we, we want to hear your questions. So as we get going through this, that little green box in the lower right hand corner, put in your questions, put in your thoughts. We want to take the conversation today uh, in, in the best way possible to to help you get out of this what, what you're looking to learn about donor displays. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn the keys over to our panelists here and uh, let them share their thoughts and ideas. I'll start off with you, Spence. If you want to share a little bit about yourself, your background with digital signage, and uh, you know, just kind of your experience with donor walls, and you know, give us a little background. There. OK, thank you, Ryan. Well, at WVU, uh, we have three campuses here in Morgantown. They're separate separated by about four miles, so our digital signage network spans those three campuses. We have oh, close to 120 uh, what we refer to as standard digital signs. We have both horizontal and vertical uh, deployments for those. We also have wayfinding and uh, now walls of honor and donor recognition walls. 
Um, we're looking in at some point here in the near future, possibly room signage uh, as well. So uh, we we kind of have a lot going on here, and there's just the three of us that uh, that uh, have one designer and, and an IT person there, and uh, we manage all of that. Keeps us pretty busy. Excellent. Well, I'll throw the same question to you, Kim. Uh, I know you were a little late in, and hopefully we've got the technical difficulties for the audio behind us, but if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your background with digital signage. Oh, we can't hear you. Sorry. Um, if you want to try switching uh, the settings, try a different audio um, while you're, you're checking that, why don't I, I lead in with Spence here if you want to... Uh, you know, start giving us a little bit more about some of the things you're doing on campus. Tell us a little bit about your key applications for donor walls. You know, where are they located? What kind of content is of interest? Who's interacting with them? Like any feedback you've got in terms of, of your user base? Well, well that's a great question. Um, you know, it, it's surprising the what you see as far as the evolution of digital signage, especially in higher education. You know, you kind of get started out on what I refer to as the standard digital signage, where you're uh, promoting the uh, standard marketing, internal marketing messages to your uh, constituencies on your campuses there. But very quickly, then the next thing, somebody's coming to you saying, "Hey, what about wayfinding?" or "Hey, what about room signs?" Well. Believe it or not, <clears throat> one of the things that has our network is eight years old now, and I would consider that a fairly mature network. We're uh, really kind of now going into that phase to where um, we're having to start replacing some of our uh, our hardware, uh, and that presents some challenges there. But what also we found was is that suddenly we had deans and departmental uh, administrators coming to us saying, "Hey, how about these? How, how about donor walls? What they would refer to as a donor wall." <clears throat> and we said, "Well, we'll look into it." Well, that put us on a journey that probably took us a, a, probably about a year uh, to do some R and D. We went to the Digital Signage Expo. We talked to some uh, people about uh, touch screen interactivity, that that sort of thing. But <clears throat> what it came down to is that these these administrators know about their internal buildings very much. They know that they only have so much real estate uh, on a wall to put brass plaques or to some sort of a recognition of the people that have done some very good things for their college or their department. Uh, there, and they they also realize that number one, those brass plaques are very expensive. That you can only put so many words on a brass plaque to say of all the wonderful things that that person has done for uh, your particular college or department. But with a digital sign, we can put them all up there because the bios that w that come up, the portrait, maybe a, a video inter uh, interview, but we can the bios can be two, three, four, five, six pages deep uh, there with touch interactivity. <coughs> so they find that that's very very useful uh, to them. We currently uh, have uh, four different applications of it there. We have two in what's call, called the CPAS, the College of, uh, College of Physical Activities and Sports Sciences, and they have two um, what we call walls of honor, and there it's on a big long wall and in, in the middle of it we have a donor recognition wall. They're vertically mounted. Uh, the walls of honor uh, are both touch interactive, pull from a database. Uh, they have their uh, important people, their bios, their portraits, uh, some video interviews, uh, that sort of thing that can be played there. And then in the central part of it is the uh, donor recognition walls and we're at the first iteration of that to where uh, they're basically listed much like you would see on a static panel by how much they've given uh, there but we're soon wanting to uh, make that touch interactive as well. We were kind of time crunched because they were dedicating this brand new building and uh, we were kind of up 
against some time constraints, so we got the touch interactivity on the two uh, walls of honor and the donor wall now as we're incorporating the database that as those levels of giving change, uh, they'll bump up into the next uh, level of giving there. Uh, we've also got one now at the uh, down at the mountain layer, which is kind of our student union, and it recognizes stuner, student donors, which is kind of a unique concept uh, that students that have given uh, to certain programs within the university are recognized for those even those small contributions. So uh, that's that's kind of a neat thing. It's it's located down there and. So far, it's been very, very uh, well received. In fact, uh, like standard digital signage, as soon as somebody sees it up in one building, next thing you know, we get a call from another dean or another department head saying, hey, how do I get three of those in my building? Uh, there, of course, all of our stuff carries a, an emergency messaging feature as well with that. So it, they just kind of work hand in hand. It's, and uh, donor recognition and walls of honor are huge right now on our campus. Great. So curious a little bit about the location. Um, are they putting them in main entryways and atriums? Like, how, how are they positioning it in each of the buildings for the deans that are interested in it? Well, at CPASS, it's a very long hallway. And what? And like I say, this was a, a brand new building. So we were able to hold some of these discussions and that's one of the things that I would suggest is try and get involved with some of those discussions especially in a new building early on in the planning phases to where instead of it just being something that's hanging on a wall it becomes something that is a part of the decor of that building uh, but this is a very long hallway wall it's one of the main hallways in that building and what they did is they they wrapped the wall Think of it kind of like a, a decal almost, but the entire length of that wall, and it was kind of a historic, as you start at the entrance of that hall, a historic journey of the it, what used to be the, the Department of Education, or the College of Educa um, Physical Education, and of course now it's called the College of Physical Activities and Sports Sciences, but all the buildings on campus that they originally started in, there's a mural kind of like that behind and then these uh, walls of honor and the donor recognition wall are over top of those decals there so it's kind of like a, almost like a museum piece in, in a lot of ways it's very subtly done as far as that that wall wrap um, and at the student union it's in the the it's a the students kind of use it for a study area it's a quiet area but it's a beautiful large room that's centrally located uh, as you come into the student union uh, there. So um, it's it's very nicely done. That that room is a very kind of ornate area. So I'm just curious when you were working with them to develop the content, was there a particular audience you were targeting? Was it students? Was it faculty? Was it donors? Was it visitors? Or were you trying to capture all of them? Well, you know, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, I think you really have to, that, that, that some of those initial conversations when you're approached about some of these things are critical because, you know, we try and get into the mind of, of what they're wanting, how they're envisioning it, and then as we go about, you know, the installation is one thing. We pretty much know how we have to do that, but when you start creating that content and designing the look and the feel of the imagery behind the content even uh, so that it, it dovetails, it falls within branding standards of the university, uh, that sort of thing. Um, we we sat there and, and uh, tried to get into their heads uh, of what they exactly wanted. Now obviously at the student union that's more student oriented and we wanted to recognize those student donors. Now those donors uh, the amounts weren't going to be the same types of amounts that uh, a large benefactor would be, but we wanted to encourage the students to um, take part uh, in uh, the idea of supporting their university at a at a young point in their careers. Uh, certainly at the college uh, level, they're mainly uh, one of the things is they're wanting to impress the students um, that are there for four years in theory um, that 
there are people that have helped make this happen. Uh, these people have uh, been a part of this college for decades. They've become successful and as they've become successful they have given back to their university. Uh, and then certainly the when we first uh, unveiled it they had a big huge ceremony uh, to unveil the new building and they brought these donors and these important people in there and some of these folks you know are in their 80s and 90s at this point some of them much younger but to see them standing in front of those uh, those touchscreen interactive and they touching their portrait and their bio pops up or their interview pops up and the smile on their face so it building rapport with um, the folks that uh, have been benefactors in the past but at the same time uh, it's telling other people hey you know if you if you even give a small amount you get recognition of some sort so you know it's a very important tool is what we're finding for these uh, especially these deans because you know in higher education it's all about uh, raising money in a lot of ways and these deans have figured out that this is a, a very good tool for them to use within the confines of, of uh, their own colleges very interesting. So, um, is there a minimum dollar amount to get your name listed on the display? What What's that threshold? Well, for the uh, for the students, uh, it's very low. I mean, they can. I I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm sure it's you know in the tens uh, uh, there to get them started. Obviously, the more somebody has given their name, bubbles up. Uh, higher there on the list there and and that's something I think too is that is going to evolve especially in that student part of it that uh, that as that catches on they'll flesh that out more and we'll we'll adjust the design to accompany uh, any kind of changes there now when you start getting into the college uh, levels those are significant donations there I mean you're talking probably Starting, you know, anywhere from five to ten thousand, and then there's a break that, you know, twenty and above, and then you've got your fifty to a hundred and a hundred to a bazillion. Uh, you know, it's broken out by that, and uh, I would, I would think that uh, if you were a benefactor, you would be looking to see where your your name bubbled up on a list at times, and and uh, hope to see it uh, uh, bubble up. Uh, over the years, so you know it's it's pretty impressive though when you see that. Well, I think one of the key arguments for digital signage in these donor recognition applications is you can cater to larger audiences, so you can recognize those lower dollar amounts because it's not a, a big monumental task or a big expense to be able to add just a few more names to the display. Whereas if you've got a large display with say etched glass or something, and somebody only gives you you know the tens of dollars it's too expensive to recognize them on there. So I think that is one of the key benefits for putting up a digital recognition board is you can just recognize a lot more people. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, uh, call to action wise, Spence, you know, is there using these to encourage people to donate more? Have they incorporated any calls to action, you know, ways to give or how to get more information into the designs? Well, you know, we're really kind of Testing getting one our feet. Yeah. Hey Kim, we got you. Great. You actually heard me? Yeah, we can. Oh, I'm so sorry to have uh, uh, interrupted you, uh, uh, Spencer. Please go forward. I just really didn't want to waste anyone's time anymore if I couldn't get this audio to work. Right. So thank you. Well, we're glad to have you, Kim. I was just saying that uh, that these these um, this they're kind of we're evolving this, uh, Ryan. That. Um, over time, we're hoping people, uh, especially the students, are going to see the benefit of, of um, you know, of giving. And this is the one down at the at the student union is done by the student uh, life group. They have uh, put up the money for the initial install there for that. It's in, got an enclosure around it, and it looks very nice. And and we've we've sub branded it for student life. Uh, as far as the background imagery goes, um, but yeah, they're they're definitely uh, it, it. People 
are seeing it and they're wanting to get their name up on it. So it's it's very good there. But you know, when we want to get Kim in here on the on the conversation, but when we get back, there are some things I'd I'd like to talk to you about a little bit about uh, when you first set out some of the initial things you ought to think about because we've kind of learned some things the hard way. Great. Well, let's uh, take a moment here and uh, sorry for everyone for the technical difficulties, but. but uh, Kim, if you want to take a moment and just uh, introduce yourself and what you do at CastNet and uh, you know, just talk a little bit about your background with digital signage to give everyone some context, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, again, I want to confirm that you can hear me. Yep, we got you great. Okay. That's great. So, yeah, my name is Kim Jones. I've been selling digital signage since way before there was a phrase digital signage. My first digital signage solution was sold to General Motors Corporation about... 20, 25 years ago, they wanted to put uh, employee information and data on uh, on TV screens for employees uh, who are working out on the line to, to keep informed about what's going on within the company. Uh, so uh, since then, I've been selling digital signage pretty much nonstop. Um, I've had stops at multiple companies doing that. Uh, Scala Corporation is uh, one of them you may have heard of. I worked with them for a couple of years. And, was a vice president of business development there. I'm now with a company called Alpha Video. We manufacture a software digital signage product called CastNet Digital Signage. Uh, it's a web-enabled solution. And uh, uh, I've been with that company exclusively for over 13 years. Uh, in my digital signage travels, I've done everything from selling to installing to writing code to graphic design work. Uh, to AV integration and systems testing. So I've kind of done a little bit of everything. So that's kind of my background. Um, was there anything else anyone wanted to ask me right now? I think that's great. Well, why don't we start off with uh, you know, just kind of your perspective on, on donor walls. You know, what are some of the key applications you guys get involved with? You know, where are they located? Uh, you know, what kind of content do you find of interest? You know, what, what type of people are interacting with donor walls specifically? You know, what and just kind of share your perspective on this specific industry with the audience. Yeah, well, I mean, the two the two big things that I, I like to think about when I think of donor walls is, you know, what's the goal of a donor wall, first of all? Uh, a donor wall's goal is to really highlight uh, and make heroes out of the wonderful people who donate their money by their free choice to organizations. I mean, that is the whole point of a donor wall. Uh, that's why donor walls have existed for years, way before there were screen technology available to do that, because they, they really do want to highlight these folks and what they've done. Um, a donor wall, an interactive donor wall, or a passive digital signage donor wall takes you a little bit farther, right? It, it allows you to give a client, I mean, a viewer, way more information about each donor, if you wish, uh, number one. Number two, it allows you to add and subtract uh, people from donor walls on a yearly or daily or hourly basis if you want to. Uh, it allows you to add photos. The typical donor walls in the old days were you know, brass plaques and the plaques on a wall. So you basically had a name and that was it. You didn't know much more about the donor. So uh, my experience is that uh, when we do donor walls, whether they're passive or interactive, they're really the whole goal is to find a way to really turn these folks into heroes who you know, give of their money or their time to make an organization they deeply believe in uh, succeed even more. Uh, so that's that's kind of where I see digital signage really bringing a lot to the table, uh, both in terms of a deeper amount of knowledge to the viewer and an easier, more powerful way, an immediate way to change the information on the donor wall quickly and easily. So Perfect. those are kind of the, the goals of a donor wall and what I run across uh, as they do this sort of thing, as, as how I want to do this sort of thing. I, uh, one of my clients is Trinity Health Network. They're looking at donor walls right now. They're the largest Catholic health organization in North America. They have 80 hospitals. Uh, we also uh, uh, handle Mayo Clinic exclusively in Cleveland Conventions. Uh, Cleveland Clinic is also one of our clients. They're all very interested in donor walls, both passive and interactive for those reasons. Great. One thing I do, th I do, I would like to just stress, in my opinion, in, in, in all of these years, uh, we get so focused on the technology that I think sometimes we forget to ask the most important question 
uh, that I think any user should ask when they're thinking about digital signage and, and really that is are we going to have in-house exports to make the content or, or not? Uh, if we want to use pre-existing labor to create the content, it's a totally different product than if you're going to have professional designers creating the content. So it's almost more important to ask that before you get into the technology because different products do different approaches better than others. Uh, so if you're going to have a team full of professional designers, you may go for a different, a totally different product for digital signage than you would if you're assuming that you know, part-time employees are going to be the ones updating the content on the screens. Yep, makes complete sense. Well, I, I think with that, let's let's touch on what makes a good digital donor wall. I'll start with you, Spence. You know, you want to share your thoughts or tips on what you learned on making a good good experience? Yeah, we we learned some really interesting things real quick, uh, and it, it's a it's a lot of th you know, it's like anything else when you first start a project. Uh, you have this concept in your mind, but then it's as you actually start putting the wheels on the wagon that you find out that uh, uh, things might not necessarily be as what you once thought. The biggest thing to us that we realized, we were so focused on hardware and software, this type of thing, the data. <laughs> the data was the big thing. You have to have these conversations up front. And this kind of goes along with what Kim was just saying. Conversations up front with these key stakeholders about getting you good data. We had to tell them right up front, look, we're not the data entry clerks. We can't, that's not what we do. So we're going to create a database. You've got to make sure that the data that's in that database is valid that it uh, you know, is up to date and that you have to make a commitment to updating that periodically and we have to figure out what that periodic part is, you know, how often because again, your, 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 your database is only as good as the data that's in it, but that this stuff when we're talking about a wall of honor or a donor wall, these are people, as Kim has said, are heroes and you want to make sure that that data about that hero is accurate uh, because I can assure you I would think they would let you know if it wasn't accurate there. So explain the rules right up front with folks about number one maintaining that database uh, and then updating that uh, and you gotta identify who is going to update that uh, that information. In other words uh, is that going to be uh, somebody in their, um, you know, in their uh, secretarial uh, pool, or is it going to be one of the administrators who's going to be be doing that? Uh, and I think it has to. Then you have to look at that design for a good call to action, and it's got to look great. That we have professional designers on our staff uh, to do that. Okay. Thanks, Vince. Um, Kim, looks like you're moving around there a bit. Uh, hopefully, we didn't lose a connection with you there. But um, can you hear us okay? I think we might have lost Kim again. <laughs> Technical difficulties all around. Um, oh, can you hear us again, Kim? I think we've lost you. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll bounce back to you, Spence, in terms of, okay. um, you know, what, what were some of the primary drivers of why to go digital when you started talking about people? You know, obviously they had uh, uh, initially, you know, some passive digital signage or traditional signage. Why did they start to go digital? Well, you know, they, one of the things that we did here, and this was uh, from some of the folks at the, uh, at the College of Media, the old journalism school, um, they had some of these static, real, real attractive static um, signs up there with donors and certain levels. But what they found was no sooner did they really get that up, those numbers and those where they have been, those people were segregated in certain uh, levels changed. And there was no quick and easy way or inexpensive way 
uh, making those changes quickly. And so uh, that was one of the drivers with that. Uh, the other thing, like I was saying at the very beginning, is they quickly realized um, that you can only put so many brass plaques on the wall, number one, before you run out of room. Number two is they're expensive. Number three is you can only put so many words on them. But the other thing was is they had so many different styles of brass plaques that there was no continuity in that look. And eventually it becomes unsightly. Uh, when you get so many of these things uh, on there. So they were kind of looking for some ways to uh, not only be able to give more in-depth information about these, these wonderful people uh, that they're honoring, but also to tidy up uh, the installation in a lot of ways. Great. Well, Kim, I think we've got you back now. Um, wouldn't mind throwing a question back to you of what makes a good digital donor wall from your perspective? Any tips to the audience? Um, first of all, can you hear me still? Yep, we can hear you. <laughs> this will be the last time I ask you that. I, I switched to a hardwire uh, internet connection because the wireless was cutting in and out too bad. So sorry about that one last change. Um, again, my a good donor wall, I mean, I, I think Spencer really addressed kind of the biggest issues that donor wall solve, which is immediacy of update of content. Uh, it eliminates the space. Uh, constantly changing and it uh, it allows you to update content easily and quickly and give them more information than just a little bit of text, the viewer. So for us, it all starts again with the content and who's going to create the content. Uh, so a digital, a digital uh, a donor wall needs to be very attractive. Uh, in our experience, motion really matters uh, in the donor wall. If you want people to pay attention to things, anyone who's stood in the middle of a field and they don't see anything and all of a sudden you see a rabbit. You saw the rabbit because the, the idiot moved. If you would have stayed still, you never would have seen him. The human brain is totally focused on motion. So you have to decide what level of attention you want to require from the viewers. Uh, and typically there's kind of two levels. One would be kind of demanding attention, which is the kind of content you put, for example, on uh, casino screens, uh, they're constantly in your face, they want to demand your attention constantly, or or cheesy car salesmen, you know, <laughs> those kind of folks. Uh, or what I like to think of for donor walls and other polite digital signage solutions, you're requesting their attention. You're not demanding it. So you need motion, but it doesn't, it, it needs to be sedate, but attractive, uh, and not over the top. So from a content point of view, um, that's that's what we're always looking for is something that when you look at it, it just looks beautiful. You want to look at it, but then to get people to look at it, you want it to have motion, some kind of smooth, progressive motion that's interesting to look at. Uh, we've done donor walls where um, it may have a whole video scene of a, of a, of a an eagle flying across a landscape along the top, and, and maybe the, in this case, the one I'm thinking of had. 20 screens in the video wall, so the eagle was flying across 20 screens. And, you know, it wasn't in your face motion, but it was very attractive and very interesting, and it got people to look at the screen. So that's first, and then second is uh, addressing Spence's challenge, the data. You know, you've got to have an easy way to update the data. Uh, updating a database is a great way. Uh, we use web forms, so people can fill out the web form and upload photos or videos. Uh, and so the bottom line is you want to make it so that your stakeholders have immediate uh, ownership of the data that shows up on the screens but doesn't require them to know anything about designing it, right? So you want them to be able to change the data but have it automatically fit into whatever the attractive design of the digital signage is. So from a content point of view, I always highly recommend a little bit of motion but not too much. And uh, in terms of updating the content, I agree with Spence. It is about the data and uh, some the stakeholders or having one person who speaks to the stakeholders who is accepting responsibility for keeping that data current and accurate. It is the biggest benefit of a donor wall. If they're going to put the money into it, uh, the biggest thing is they, you know, they can change the content and they can keep it accurate and current. But if you've got the infrastructure in place but then you don't take advantage of it, uh, you start to sense that your investment was not a good investment because it's not realizing uh, what I like to call ROO, 
return on objective, which is similar to return on investment, but there's a lot of things in digital signage that don't, that don't have an immediate ROI, but they do have a very clear objective. Makes sense. So curious, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about content. Let's talk about the hardware side of it for just mm -hmm. a second. Physical size-wise, uh, I'll start with you, Kim. You know, what's the smallest you've dealt on and what's the biggest? I know we see a lot of interactive video walls and stuff these days. And is there a ideal size in, in projects or is it really dictated by the application? It Well, uh, in terms of sizes of interactive and passive content, uh, I've personally done content and sold and provided solutions from everything from a meeting room screen that's uh, an iPad screen. Uh, which is about as teeny as you can get for digital signage, uh, you know, all the way up to a uh, huge uh, cube style video walls. Uh, we have in casinos, we have some video walls that can be that can be a circular video wall that wraps around the interior of a whole building. I did that at Bloomberg Financial News Network, where they have an LED that's the, in, from pixel res resolution point of view, it's 4,000 pixels wide by 200 pixels high that goes over an LED that wraps all the way around the inner side of the Bloomberg uh, corporate headquarters. So so looking more uh, specifically at donor recognition, what's the biggest uh, donor wall that uh, you've been You know, with? donor walls, in my opinion, and, and from my personal experience, rarely get above four or five video walls. The biggest question, first of all, is it going to be interactive or is it going to be passive? If it's interactive, then you have very specific technical restrictions in terms of the kind of screens that you you can use and the approaches you're going to take. If it's interactive and you want to do a large presence on a video wall but still have it be interactive, we typically have a smaller interactive touch screen on a podium in front of the large video wall. So the viewers are actually interacting with the touch screen in front of the video wall and that allows us then to go with as large a video wall with as large a screens as we want. Uh, because we're not having to do make that video wall actually touch sensitive. Uh, the the available touch screens that actually respond correctly to the touch uh, over a large video wall are actually uh, not that many. As a matter, of, you basically have to find some kind of custom mask, and it gets very very expensive. So with with touch screen or interactive video walls uh, or donor walls, typically if they want to do more than one screen. Uh, then we recommend that they go with an interactive small screen for the user interaction in front of the video wall screens and when then we create the content so that when the user makes a selection the content instantly changes on the video walls to whatever content they've selected. If it's passive it gets to be much simpler and by passive I mean you know there's no interactive, there's no touch screen, it's just people walking by the screen and watching the content because all digital signage kind of breaks out into those two types. It's either going to be interactive or passive digital signage. And with passive, all of a sudden, there's really no restrictions. Uh, but typically, you need to take into account how far away people are going to be from the screen. If they're going to be two feet away from the screen, do you really want an eight-screen video wall? Probably not. They'll get a sunburn just walking up to the screen, right? Uh, it's just too much, too close. Uh, so distance is a big deal. Interactivity is a big deal. Uh, if it's going to be passive, usually four screens is a good size for a video wall. Uh, it, it's a good average distance. If you're eight feet away, it looks great. Um, and then we can get into the details if you want to, because there's been a the way video walls actually work have changed a lot behind the scenes in the past couple of years. And um, depending on how close you are to the screen, may depend on may define the technology you use to put the content on the screens. But I don't want to get into too much detail right now. But basically, you're you're either sending a 1920 by 1080 and cutting and dicing it and exploding it up on multiple screens, or you're sending a 1920 by 1080 actual graphic to each one of those screens as a larger, like let's say 4K channel or larger, uh, which looks way better. And you may need to do that if you're going to have people up close to the screen. So there's a lot of things to take in, into account that are all about the content and the user experience. And it's always about distance away from the screen uh, and whether it's going to be passive or interactive. Those are like the first two big questions. Gotcha. Spence, anything to add in terms of size based on your experience and some of the walls you've put in? Yeah, we, uh, we've kind of found 
the sweet spot for us is around a 50 inch monitor. Um, the reason being much like what Kim was saying is that um, first off you want to attract people to it. Uh, it's got to be big enough to do that but we refer to it as the throw. In other words from where the the monitor is to how far away somebody is. Um, you know, if you're throw, trying to throw 10 feet or 20 feet, um, you've got to be able to, they've got to be able to see it. Uh, but if they're up on top of it um, and it's, you know, mounted too high and the buttons, if it's interactive, uh, you know, everything that we do is ADA compliant. So that means that uh, from the uh, interactivity standpoint, I believe it's 54 inches, uh, you've got to make accommodations so that people can access those buttons that uh, would potentially be in a wheelchair. Um, the other thing is, you know, when you're talking about passive versus interactive, if you're going interactive, that is an extra layer of technology that you're going to have to account for. Um, not only, that's why I say when I mentioned earlier, we probably spent close to a year doing some research and development of how we were going to do that because we knew that this was going to become a model for us because we already, before we had the first one launched, we already had inquiries about uh, more. So uh, we wanted to try and do it right from the uh, from the get-go. So uh, you have to figure out your software, you got to figure out your hardware. If it's going to be interactive, you've got to figure out how you're going to do your interactivity, but uh, also if it's going to be ADA compliant, that everything from mounting where the, the on the wall it's going to be mounted, how far out from the the wall it can come, um, you know, and where these interactive buttons would be be located, you got to take that into account for your design as well. Great. Well, we're we're starting to wind down here to towards the end of our, our conversation, so I just want to remind everyone if you do have any last questions, if you want to fire those into that uh, Q and A box, so uh, we'd be happy to answer those uh, before we wrap up here. Um, so while we're just waiting on any final questions, uh, I'll throw just a couple more at you guys. I'll start with you, Spence. Any quick tips on best practices or key pitfalls to avoid for somebody starting out or planning a video uh, a donor wall? Yeah, big thing is is have good conversations with folks. Know what they want early on. Um, a lot of times they don't know, so you're going to have to kind of be a good teacher. Uh, you're going to have to let them know what's available and what their commitment, not only financially but also time-wise, to feeding that beast. Because, like I say, uh, on these walls of honor, dinner walls, if you've got um, a database of some sort associated with it or a spreadsheet somebody's got to update that uh, on a regular basis uh, otherwise it's not going to be a good deployment for you uh, I think that uh, at the same time uh, you have to uh, understand what what the concept what they really need that donor wall or that wall of honor to do are they going to need video for instance, if they need videos, that's all a function of time of getting those videos shot and getting them the right size and uh, the right codecs, all that sort of thing. If they need the bios, who's writing the bios? Have the bios been updated recently? Uh, what about portraits uh, of these people? So there's a lot of stuff that goes in behind the scenes before you can even think about lighting the thing up. Uh, so those would be my... my uh, my words of wisdom to them is to do your homework up front and have some very good conversations early on. Great. Same question to you, Kim. Any suggestions on best practices or key pitfalls to avoid? Well, I, I, I really appreciate Spencer's input because it, it kind of validates my experience over the 25 years in digital signage over and over again. When the system doesn't go well, this would be key pitfalls. It's because those discussions about content didn't happen up front before the technology was chosen. The technology is second. You need to understand what kind of content you want to put on the screen and who's going to put it on. Those two are key, key questions. If you want to use pre-existing employees uh, or students who have some other job as their main job, that's, there are products out there that focus on that kind of a solution that makes it easy for non-design, non-technical people to update the content. If you're going to depend on professional designers in-house to do it, um, then that's a, there are different products that do that better. 
uh, and then the kind of content you want. Uh, so it's who's going to update it and the kind of content. Videos, who's going to create the content, is that put in place? Once you have those two questions answered, it will help you make the decision on all the technology afterwards because different technologies work better in different approaches. Gotcha. We did have a question come in about audio. You know, how do you tie in audio to a, a big donor wall? I'll start with you, Kim. Any experience or tips of advice on Absolutely. Audio? audio is the most dangerous element in any digital signage solution. Uh, uh, digital signage software usually is in a looping kind of mode, which means it's constantly looping information. If you have audio tied to that information, anyone who's been to Disney World for one day by the end of the day, you want to kill whoever plays It's a Small World After All one more time. If you, if you hear the same audio over and over again, your head will explode. Whoever's managing the system will have, within one day, 500 complaints saying, how do we turn this crap off? What usually happens is that someone just walks over and turns all the screens off because they just can't stand it anymore. So audio, there's, there's, in my opinion, there's really only two acceptable ways to have audio. Uh, one is as a, uh, a radio feed or, or iTunes feed of just constantly changing background music that never repeats as a, what we call a sound bed. That's typically done for like cable channels and things like that, not donor walls. Or if you want to play videos that have audio, then you want to exact schedule those not in the loop. You want them to appear maybe once every hour so that they show, they play the audio, and then they're back to the quiet loop. If you want to have looping videos of humans talking, things like that, then you need to create the video with subtitles. That's really the only way to do it, in my opinion. I have a strong opinion, obviously, on, on audio. I've, I've had lots of angry calls when I didn't do it this way. So. Gotcha. I, that's a great question. Audio is a big deal in terms of what you do and don't do. Okay. Spence, do you have any experience? Did you try to incorporate audio into any of your walls? Oh, I think you may be muted, Spence. Are you there? We're having loads of fun audio question issues today. So I'm so glad it's not just me, Spence. I feel <laughs> you playing, dude. I I just went through 20 minutes of this. Yeah, we lost you, Spence. I'm not sure what happened. Okay, well, uh, good thing it happened uh, at the very end. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll turn the keys back to Brian. Uh, if you just want to do a quick uh, kind of closing summation, some tips or housekeeping notes from the DSF. Yeah, sure thing. And I guess uh, Kim hated audio so much uh, in donor walls, he shut off Spence there. So, <laughs> <laughs> I did Great. I did kind of jinx the whole audio thing, didn't yeah, I, from, the day, yeah. from minute one. Sorry about guess, that, guys. I guess you're fairly passionate about that, so we get the point, Kim. Um, yeah. <laughs> Again, thank you, uh, Kim, Spence, Ryan, uh, for moderating this. Uh, obviously, these types of discussions are, are very um, unique in certain circumstances, but this is what the Digital Signage Federation is about, is bringing best practices of particular types of digital signage and use of digital signage so that uh, our members, who are both end users and vendors, are creating the best projects possible. Um, my email um, is available on the Digital Signage Federation website and you can contact us there too so it's just digitalsignagefederation.org um, if you have any questions about this particular presentation if you have any questions you didn't ask during the presentation you'd like to get answered please by all means send those uh, my way and I'll, I'll make sure that our panelists get those and, and can answer them this along with all of our hangouts is uh, recorded and on our YouTube channel and those are also embedded on our website so if you have any questions uh, or want to take a look at previous hangouts please let us know by all means and as Ryan invited uh, you earlier if there are people on this call who feel that they would be um, good panelists for some of our upcoming discussions uh, please send your your name and your ideas my way and uh, we'll get you linked up and evaluated to see if it's a good fit uh, finally, uh, I wanted to let you know that the DSF webs, uh, website will have the upcoming Hangout schedule through July on it, and we will send out notice to anybody who's attended a Google Hangout before, and of course all of our DSF members. 
um, about that uh, schedule. And particularly for those interested in higher education, if you would like to uh, receive a discount code to go to the UB Tech um, conference in June, please send me an email and I can get that information to you. Great. Okay? And just as a reminder, I'll, I'll flash up uh, email addresses here. So Brian's email address is on the screen for anybody that wants to reach out to him for either that UB Tech uh, discount code or any ideas or thoughts on, on upcoming panels. So um, you know, with that, I think uh, we can wrap things up. We're encroaching right here on our, our hour mark. So uh, Spence, Kim, Brian, thanks a lot for the time and, and sharing your knowledge. And uh, for all of our attendees out there, we appreciate you taking uh, some time out of your day to learn a little bit more about uh, some of the great things the Digital Science Federation is doing and some of the applications. So great. until next time, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ryan.